The most common symptoms in ME are, I think, grouped under three main headings. The brain symptoms, and in particular here we have what we call cognitive dysfunction. This is problems with normal mental activity, problems with short-term memory, concentration, attention span, being able to process new information and retrieve information. Um, balance problems are a characteristic feature of this illness. People don't describe this as sort of feeling dizzy spinning round. They say that they feel as though they're constantly unsteady when they're walking along, as though they might be walking on rubber, as though they've probably had too much to drink. And we know that the balance centres in the brain may be disturbed in this illness. And a third part of the brain abnormalities in this illness, causing brain symptoms, um, is what we call symptoms relating to the autonomic nervous system. And in medical jargon, we call this orthostatic intolerance. This is problems related to being able to stand up for a long period of time, or symptoms relating to changing posture from being flat or lying down to standing up in which case there may be a change in blood pressure, a lowering of blood pressure, calling, causing what we call orthostatic hypotension, a fall in blood pressure when changing posture. And this causes problems such as feeling faint, sweating, or even feeling sick. So we have this group of important neurological symptoms, which I think fully justifies this disease being called a neurological illness by WHO. We then have the very characteristic muscle dis symptoms, which I've already described, the exercise-induced muscle fatigue, pain, which can be very severe in some people. It's not always present, isn't muscle pain, but pe muscle pain can be a, a very major feature of this illness. We then have what I call the infective immunological type symptoms, the feeling as though you've got a sort of ongoing flu-like illness, which may be accompanied by feelings of sore throats, enlarged glands. And then finally, um, I think the other key symptom of this illness is the sleep disturbance. I think you cannot have this illness without some form of sleep disturbance. And it's interesting that in the very early stages, this sleep disturbance may be an excessive requirement of sleep, what we call hypersomnia, particularly in the early post-viral stage. And then this quite often moves on to another type of sleep disturbance whereby people have either difficulty initiating sleep, getting off to sleep, they have erratic sleep, they may wake uh, up early in the morning, but they are no longer having to sleep 12, 14 hours a day. Um, and whatever type of sleep disturbance they have, they will describe the fact that they wake up and feel unrefreshed. They have unrefreshing sleep, whatever type of sleep disturbance they have. So those, I think, are the, the, the key core symptoms of this illness. There are many other symptoms which are, are, are associated with it. Um, increased sensitivity to light and noise. Increased sensitivity to alcohol is a very interesting symptom, which I think is, is diagnostic of this illness. But I think the, the brain, the muscle, the infective and the sleep symptoms are the core ones that you would make the diagnosis on. The symptoms that can be treated, and I think really should be treated by a doctor when they occur, um, are pain and sleep disturbance. And if it actually occurs as part of the illness, then obviously uh, any sort of depressive component. So as far as pain is concerned, um, there are a number of drugs which doctors can consider prescribing when ordinary types of pain reliever like aspirin and brufen and uh, paracetamol are found to be ineffective. And we have a, if you like, a, a step ladder of pain killing drugs available on prescription, which could be considered when, when these sort of ordinary painkillers aren't working. And examples of the sort of drugs which might be used, there is a, a drug called amitriptyline, which is a sedating tricyclic antidepressant drug, which is used at a very low dose. It's not used as a depressive uh, the sort of dose that you would use to treat depression. It's used at a very low dose and at the very low dose it can help with pain, it can help with, with muscular pain, neuropathic nerve pain 
and it can also, because it has a sedating effect, um, help with sleep disturbance. So that is, is one drug that could certainly be discuss, um, discussed with the patient. Um, if pain is more severe, then there are other drugs which um, pain relief doctors who specialize in this type of, of medicine might consider using, um, one of which is called gabapentin. Um, this is a drug which is actually normally used to treat epilepsy, but it's also been found, again, at a different type of dose and regime, um, to be very helpful in some types of pain relief, particularly pain relief that involves nerve pain. Um, there are various drugs which can help with sleep disturbance in addition to possibly um, amitriptyline. Um, there are groups of drugs which can help people, they're very short acting drugs, they can help people get off to sleep uh, and they're just used for a very short period of time. Um, there is also some evidence that uh, the drug melatonin which is used to help people cope with jet lag can be helpful in some people with this illness. and people with this illness who have a very uh, disturbed form of sleep disturbance, sometimes they get a, a complete reversal of sleep rhythm. Um, that, that is something that could be considered in those circumstances. And as I say, if, if someone has a clinical depression with this illness, and clinical depression is something that can occur with any long-term illness, especially when you're having all the problems that you're having with an illness like ME, then that always has to be taken seriously because we know that sadly some people with ME who, who are very upset because of all the things that are happening around them do actually contemplate and just occasionally even commit suicide. So depression, clinical, true clinical depression as opposed to just feeling fed up with this illness must be taken seriously and again if, if necessary treated with antidepressants. Sadly at the same time we have groups of symptoms which are not amenable to drug treatment and one example there would be the problems that people have with cognitive function, problems with memory, concentration and it would be wonderful if we as doctors have some sort of drug that we could help people with that type of symptom cope with better. Um, other treatments in addition to the key aspects of management which of course are activity management and pacing and dealing with symptoms such as pain and sleep disturbance are I think that any doctor who is dealing with this illness um, has to deal with the many practical aspects that this illness creates for their patients. So I think they have to be very proactive and supportive in relation to things like helping them with their benefit applications, giving them a suitable advice on what they should do in relation to work and employment, and in the case of children and adolescents, helping them with their education, which might involve trying to get home tuition if a child is able to do so, and integration back into school at a very gradual level um, if the child is well enough to start returning to school. Help for people with severe ME is very sadly lacking, certainly here in the UK, and I suspect the same picture applies throughout the rest of Europe. Um, many of these people who are wheelchair bound, house bound or bed bound have no access to medical services. They are unable to get to hospital clinics for appointments obviously and at the same point we have a number of specialist referral hospital based services here in the UK now but these clinics by and large are not providing home, uh, home visiting domiciliary services for people with severe ME. So there is a major problem for this group of patients in accessing medical services and it is something that really should be addressed as a matter of urgency and we have tried to do that uh, through the all party parliamentary group um, on ME but it very much relates to the willingness of physicians and people looking after patients at a hospital based level to try and set this in motion and sadly that is not, that is not happening. Heeft u een vraag naar aanleiding van deze video? Reageer op YouTube of tweet naar het MECVS Vereniging of mail naar wvp.me-cvsvereniging.nl. De beste vragen worden in een volgende video behandeld.